Hey, welcome to another beautiful day here in the field. This time I'm in southeastern Texas in an open oak slash scrubland savanna, and the topic of discussion is an introduction to ichnology. I'm going to get into the who, what, where, when, why, and how of ichnology, but first I just want to point out why it's interesting and why it's useful. Uh, it's not just about geology. A lot of people think ichnology is a side branch of geology. Um, it, it is that, but there's also neo-ichnology, which is a study of modern traces. Uh, of course, ichnology is derived from the Greek ichnos, meaning footprint or track. Ology is the science. It's really literally the oldest profession in the world. Before people were doing anything else, they were having to track game animals to find things to eat, to hunt for clothing, for food, and so forth. So ichnology is truly the oldest science in the world, some of the earliest artwork ever found. Um, so ichnology has really been around since the dawn of humanity, basically, and for good reason. Take a look behind me, and you don't see any deer, no foxes, not a lot of life at all, except for the plants, of course, and maybe some insects or birds. But with ichnology, I can get a lot of good information, a lot of hard data of what's living here. For example, Right down here is a huge colony of harvester ants. These are ants that subsist on seeds, eat a little bit of animal matter, but mostly seeds. Harvester ant nests are a really good proxy if you find them in the rock record or even the recent sedimentary record. Good proxy for having seeding plants. They need plants if they're going to be a happy colony. Harvester ant nests can go down dozens of feet. You've probably seen videos where guys make aluminum casts of these things, incredibly dense networks, and they last for decades. A single queen can keep a nest going for a couple of decades and create these huge networks of branching um, chambers and galleries, really spectacular. But there's more. There's also things like footprints. So I've got really beautiful footprints of deer. I've got a variety of footprints of other animals, and there's yet more than that. So let's take a quick look around, see some of the other cool ignites I found. Ignites, by the way, is what you call traces or neo-trace fossils in the making. Some people call them ichnofossils. Something like this really is not an ichnofossil yet, so it's technically an ignite. Ignite includes modern and ancient traces, so we'll stick with that. Let me show you some cool modern ignites and tell you a little bit about the stories behind them, and you'll get a feel for why ichnology is such a powerful science, and then we'll get into the nitty-gritty of how it's used in geology. All right, so let's first talk about what. What is a trace fossil? What is an ichnite? Basically, it's any remnant of a living organism that's left an impression on a substrate or a matrix. That could be things like roots from plants. It can be things like borings or feeding traces in tree trunks, in fossil wood. That's a matrix. So something that's bored into or burrowed into or chewed into a wood is leaving a trace and ignite on that wood. It can be things on the sediment itself. It can be resting traces, nesting traces. It can be locomotion traces like footprints, crawling marks, anything like that. It can be feeding pits where animals are digging up food. I'll show you some examples of those in a little bit. It can be dwelling structures like the ant nest I showed you. So it's literally any mark that a living organism whether it's a fungus, a plant, an animal, an algae, anything like that is leaving on the substrate. That's what trace fossils are. That's what ichnites are. And of course, they can enter the rock record. They get preserved in sedimentary environments where the sediment gets preserved. And there they form the basis of ichnology in the sedimentary world. So a lot of, uh, I guess you call them paleoichnologists, spend a lot of time looking at all these traces in the rock record. What I'm looking at right now would be classified as neo -ichnology. So this is traces left behind by currently living organisms. And a great example of that, I promised you some, here's one. This is a patch of sand that's been rolled around in by a mule. I happen to know it's a mule because it's my mule. So we've got a nice rolling trace. This would be a, not really a locomotion trace, more of a resting trace. It's not quite burrowing activity because mules don't really burrow, but it's showing you an activity. And you can reconstruct that activity. You can see little bits of uh, where his legs were kind of um, laying down in the sand. You can see where his hooves were when he got back up, his body impressions. So mules, all quadrupeds that roll around, leave pretty distinct rolling traces like this. You can actually reconstruct sequences of events from 
overlapping ignites, tiered ignites they're called. And in this case, there's an interesting story to be told in this mule trace. So we're gonna zoom in on this mule trace. You can see some of his hoof prints. You can see the body print. You can see where his legs were kind of splayed out. But, oh, look at this, there's something else. There's a second story to be told. There's a fox poop. And I know it's a red fox because I see the little red fox almost every day. It lives here. And that fox has left a poop. That poop is made up of different elements. You can see there's some granular stuff. It raids the neighbor's cat food dish. There's some vegetation. So it's telling you it ate something maybe because it had digestive problems from eating the cat food. And it's a fox poop laid on top of a mule impression. So that sort of gives us an interesting insight into the ecology of the region. We now know there's large herbivores, we know there's small mesocarnivores, but we also know something about what the mesocarnivores are eating. So that tells us a little bit about the ecosystem here. You can picture in the fossil record, finding something like this would be a treasure trove of information that might not be preserved in bones. So you'd have evidence of larger animals doing their thing, you'd have evidence of smaller animals pooping and what they're eating and what's available for them to eat. So a lot of ecological information. In fact, that's what makes ichnology such a great asset for traditional ecological knowledge studies to EK. Um, a lot of people that have lived very close to the environment for generations can tell you a whole lot about ecosystems and their subtle shifts and change in response to things like uh, climate change, industrialization, and so on, because their livelihood a lot of times depends on the health and well-being of the local flora and fauna. So they recognize any changes in behaviors or activities based on technology. Let's take a look at some more evidence of what's happening here in interactions, and then we'll talk a little bit more about paleo -ichnology. A lot of little organisms like to live under things for shelter, um, fungus and small vertebrates and invertebrates. It makes sense because big organisms like me and you, we all like that too. So let's take a look under this board. Ah, yeah, see? That is a lizard burrow. And again, I know it's a lizard burrow because I've seen lizards uh, burrowing in there. You get little fun animals like scorpions. They make little burrows under here, shallow burrows. Um, oh, it looks like there's a dead something that it's been eating. Yeah. Oh, you know what? That's the lizard. Uh-oh. So something happened to the lizard. Uh, these are his burrows that are abandoned. There's the lizard. So proof of the trace maker in action. Don't know what happened to him. Um, but there's additional little burrows of his. Well, that's a bummer. I should have pointed out too that a body fossil is the physical remains of the animal. So it's shell, skeleton, soft tissues, um, shed skin, anything like that, the physical remains of the organism. Different than the ichnite or the trace fossil, which is the result of the activity of that animal or that fungus or plant on uh, the substrate. So that was a good example of a body fossil next to a trace fossil or a body fossil in the making next to a trace fossil in the making. So it's a body next to an ignite. Let's try to find something a little less grim and uh, continue on. I didn't mention it before when we were looking at the fox scat, which is a technical term for poop, uh, sitting in the mule impression, but scat is another type of ignite. It's considered a trace fossil or an ignite, not a body fossil. Because again, it's not part of the living organism, it's something that came out of it. But scat, like the stuff behind me, which is from a mule and a couple of ponies, and I know that because they're standing here looking at me wondering what I'm doing talking about their leavings, is often the basis for a whole nother ecosystem. And to appreciate that, we're gonna have to get a little bit closer and thankfully you can't smell this. It actually doesn't smell that bad. It doesn't have any smell at all. It's mostly grass. But let me show you what I'm talking about. So here's the dung or scat, and you know, large herbivores make dung, but dung attracts dung beetles, little insects that make dung balls. You might've seen them in documentaries and they bury them in a nest chamber and the larva hatches, eats the dung and then hatches into an adult beetle. But more importantly to us right now is this pit in the dung. Now that's not made by dung beetles. And in fact, you can see there's little footy impressions here. These are made by skunks because skunks like eating dung beetle larvae. So you've got three tiers of traces. You've got the poop, you've got the burrow, and then you've got the excavation, the feeding. A whole lot of information just from a little hole in the ground surrounded by poop. And in fact, in some outcrops, like in the Morris Information, which is a late Jurassic 
environment not too dissimilar from the one behind me right here, sort of a dry land, seasonal savanna with some trees, we find dung beetle burrows, basically identical to modern ones, which helps reinforce the paleoecological interpretation of the Mars information being something like this. And now you know. Okay, I talked a fair amount about the what of the ecology um, here on a very specific environment. But let's talk a little bit about the who. Who cares about this stuff? All right, so obviously I talked about some of the earliest human beings, but there's also people like ecologists that care about ecology today. So ecologists are able to do non-invasive sampling by collecting scat or examining kill sites or den sites, collecting hair. You can do DNA studies without having to dart the animal, put it under stress. Or in some really remote areas, ecological data might be the only data you've got if you're dealing with a really rare animal like a mountain lion or something like that. Forensics specialists care a lot about ecology. So looking at things like domestic beetle borings in the bone of a, of a skeleton that you found might tell you something about how long the skeleton's been laying there, what season um, it, it came to be deposited, if it's been chewed on by predators and so on. So if you find a body that's been gnarled, you know, coyotes have had their way with it or something, that's giving you some information on how long it's been there or where it might have come from. Of course, planetary geology is all the rage these days, so a lot of people are looking to trace fossils um, and ignites as a way of confirming that there may be life on other planets, asteroids, moons, and so on. So people are starting to look for how do we identify things that might be traces versus things that might be inorganic. Some things look a lot like traces. You might have seen in Mars recently, uh, there's been studies of features that some people interpret as trace fossils, other people interpret them as weird mineral growth. And the fact remains, there's a lot of basic work yet to be done on Earth in rocks of Precambrian and Cambrian age. There's a lot of debate about some structures that have been found in the Precambrian and Cambrian. Are they traces? Are they body fossils? Are they neither? So we still don't really understand ichnology well enough on Earth that we can make an informed uh, decision about some of this stuff on, on planets or asteroids or moons outside of Earth. I'm getting yelled at by a couple of hawks here. Um, wow, interesting. Anyway, uh, finally, the people that care a lot about technology are the energy industry folks, oil, gas, and increasingly water, carbon sequestration, geothermal. The reason for that is that traces record very specific environments. Specific organisms live in specific settings. Those environments translate to very specific sand body dimensions, architecture, shape, and morphology. If you're dealing with a clastic environment, if you're dealing with a carbonate environment, Likewise, very specific environments can really indicate specific shapes of the resulting sedimentary body. Of course, that has a major impact on the shape, dimensions, and orientation of your reservoir body. So if you're talking oil, gas, water, geothermal, carbon sequestration, it's all about the reservoir. You're looking for an area that's a container that holds fluids of some type, whether you're pumping them in or pumping them out. And the trace fossils can help you constrain the shape and dimensions of these reservoirs. Okay, so this is bringing us to the how of ichnology. Well, to understand that, first we have to do a little bit of Linnaean binomial nomenclature. By that, I mean trace fossils are usually given a specific and a generic name, included in families and so on, just like living organisms. So, for example, a trace made by a calianacid shrimp, which is a ghost shrimp that's common in sandy beaches and carbonate beaches all around the world. The trace is called Ophiomorpha because it's got specific characteristics. In this case, little small pellets that line the outside of the burrow are made by the shrimp to reinforce the walls because it lives in a substrate that's prone to collapsing. So they're basically like bricks in a chimney or bricks in a well to reinforce that structure. So Ophiomorpha is very distinctive in that it's a vertical, large diameter burrow, you know, about the size of your finger or so. Some can be smaller, some can be larger, but typically fairly large. With these pelleted linings, there's all different types of pellets. And based on the shape of the pellets and the orientation of the pellets and um, all sorts of features of them, there's different species of Ophiomorpha. It starts to get really hairy. That being said, it's good to at least identify certain ichnotaxa because they often correlate with specific environments. So I showed you the harvester ant nests, which are very specific to this sort of an environment, kind of open woodland setting with ample seed heads on grasses and herbaceous plants. I showed you 
the mule rolling tree. So that's not very specific to any environment. Mules can live pretty much anywhere terrestrially, except in the Antarctic, right? You're going to find mules anywhere. Um, likewise, small carnivores like foxes can pretty much live anywhere. So their traces might not be super specific. However, things like a ghost shrimp, which lives in a very specific marine setting, can be pretty helpful. We know they like saline waters. They've got to have marine salinity. We know they like loose substrate like sands or carbonate sands, something like that. They've got to have oxygen, nutrients, and so on. After a century plus of studying these traces, we have a pretty good handle on where a lot of these organisms live. So for example, a beach has a very specific set of ichnites. You can call them an ichno assemblage. And a beach assemblage is distinctive from a marsh, which is distinctive from a fluvial or floodplain assemblage, which in turn is distinctive from an offshore assemblage or deep water assemblage. So different assemblages of traces, which when you combine them with sedimentology are called ichnophases. These ichnophases delineate specific environments. And by mapping up these ichnophases, you can often correlate deep marine settings all around an area, you can often correlate shallow marine settings all around an area and things as specific as delta fronts, shore faces, barrier islands, tidal bars, because each of these sub environments has its own very distinctive trace assemblage, ignite assemblage, because of the different types of organisms that live in these very specific environments. So ichnology from core data or image log data can actually, if you've got enough of it, help you delineate the outlines of these sedimentary bodies in subsurface, which of course you can imagine is really important for oil, gas, geothermal, and especially carbon sequestration. If you've got trace fossils penetrating an otherwise impervious shale and allowing sand to go through that shale, then potentially you've got gas escaping. So your carbon sequestration reservoir might not be so good. And of course you can pick up specimens on the outcrop and bring them around with you to show off to people. This is a beautiful Jurassic specimen of the Sundance Formation. And on it, you can see some large diameter burrows like this. This is a marine rock, by the way. And this large diameter burrow is probably made by something like a mud shrimp or even a big polychaete worm. Um, it's a horizontal burrow sitting on the horizontal surface of the sediment. There's a lot of smaller burrows and scratch marks as well, made by a variety of organisms. A lot of times people are concerned with what made that. Uh, it's sometimes really hard to identify the specific organism that made these traces. What's more important is that it tells you there's an ecosystem happening down there with ample nutrients, ample oxygen, probably warm enough temperature that it's not, you know, so cold they can't live. It's not so hot they can't live. The salinity is probably good. And in the rock record, trace fossils convey a tremendous amount of information that's not necessarily available only from the sedimentary structures alone or even the geochemistry. Sedimentary structures like ripples, trough cross beds, planar beds can be found in a whole variety of environments, everything from alien dunes to deep marine. So sedimentary structures alone aren't super helpful in many cases. There are some that are, but in general, they, they don't tell you as much as some people pretend they do. Trace fossils are incredible records, what we call the physical chemical conditions at the time of deposition. Physico, meaning the physical environment, um, things like what was sedimentation rate, was it rapid, was it slow, how high was groundwater table, was there a groundwater table. The chemical refers to the chemical environment at the time of trace excavation or construction or leaving behind. And that's things like how much oxygen was there, was there oxygen, what are the nutrient levels like, what's the salinity like. So it tells you about the chemical environment. So we combine them and you get a pretty good profile of what was happening physically and chemically in the groundwater, seawater, lake water, subaerial conditions, and so on. So trace fossils, because they don't get moved around, right? A body fossil of a dinosaur drops dead can get picked up during a flood and transported out to sea. It's mobile after it dies. That's a whole field of science called taphonomy. Trace fossils pretty much stay put. They're excavated in the sediment. They stay there. They're not likely to go anywhere, unless you're talking about a boring and a dinosaur bone made by a dermestid beetle or a log that's been chewed into by a beetle and then gets transported. But if it's in the sediment itself, the trace fossil pretty much stays put. In fact, it does stay put. So it's a great record of what was happening at the time of deposition. And if you look at all the available data that can be encompassed by trace fossils, it's pretty impressive. You can actually backtrack out from the individual traces 
to the trace assemblages, back to the ecosystem, and reconstruct from that the actual ambient conditions. And there's obviously a lot more that we can talk about. You know, you can take an entire semester and barely scratch the surface of what ichnology can be used for. Naming these traces would be a class unto itself, and that's, like I said, something we don't really care about right now. That's a topic for another discussion, another video or something like that. But I just wanted to give you an idea of what ichnology is, why I'm always talking about it, why a lot of sedimentary geologists are talking about it. And if you overhear some wildlife specialists talking about it, now you know why they're interested in it. So I hope you found this kind of interesting and helpful. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.